Hello, and thanks for joining us. Uh, today we'll be discussing circuit protection solutions specifically aimed at designs migrating to USB 3.0 and how to ensure protection of those USB ports. Uh, joining us today will be T Connectivity's Build Application Engineer, Barry Brents. Hi, Barry. Hey, Josh. Good morning. How you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, say, Barry, we see a lot of designs uh, incorporating the 3.0 platform and you know, obviously those engineers are looking at the benefits of 3.0 such as increased data rates um, but you know, also with that are increased power levels so um, what are some of the challenges and solutions that those engineers uh, should consider on the front end of their design? Well, well, with an increased data rate, you, you're working at a higher frequency, so you've got to worry about um, the effects of whatever protection you put in there, and we'll talk about that, particularly capacitance of, of TDS diodes, and, and then also the increased power means your, your uh, uh, overcurrent protection uh, needs to accommodate that, so we'll talk about the higher current levels a little bit, too. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, I'd say let, let's get started. If you have some things you can share with us and shed some light on the subject, that'd be great. Okay, I'll go and switch over to the presentation. Hopefully, you'll be able to see this. Okay, can you see the uh, the PowerPoint slide now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, and then um, uh, everybody listening, I'll uh, you know feel free to ask questions through the chat. And and Josh, um, if I don't see a question pop up, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, um, with any points or anything you want to make, so it's as informal and uh, useful as possible. But um, so we'll get right into it. Um, so this is what we'll talk about: uh, uh, the uh, USB two and three, uh, and and a little bit about the uh, power delivery spec, which is a new thing. And then we'll get into the products, uh, particularly the the uh, poly switch devices for over current protection, and then. Uh, uh, DBS diodes for over voltage protection or static discharge protection, and then our hybrid solutions, which are combination devices. Um, so, USB 2 and 3 we'll go into. Um, so, this slide is just showing uh, uh, the, the, the products uh, for USB 2 and 3 poly switch devices, ESD protection in our, in our polyzen, and, and uh, as, as everybody transitions from USB 2 to USB 3, you know, there's higher data rates and, and other things we, we mentioned, and we'll get into that more. Um, is this a schematic showing okay? Um, yep, everything looks sure. good. Everything looks good. Okay, so this is showing just a simple schematic of USB 2, and um, USB 2 is great, but uh, and it was much better than USB 1, but as data rates get higher and people want to watch movies on their portable devices, you need more bandwidth. Um, so in USB Two, you had you had the D plus and D minus, which are the two data lines, and then the power, which is on the B bus, and then a ground. So just four wires. And um, on the left, we're showing our uh, poly switch device for overcurrent protection. Um, and again, we'll talk about these these particular devices in a, in just a minute. And um, and then static discharge protection devices in parallel, shown here. And anytime you put something in parallel with your data line. Um, it, you're putting capacitance in parallel, and capacitance is, you know, a, a, a material property where, at higher frequencies, the impedance goes down, and um, as you go to higher frequencies in USB 3, um, uh, that capacitance can attenuate your signal. So, in the past, where a, a, a simple off-the-shelf high-capacitance, low-cost TBS diode um, was not a problem, um, as you move to higher speeds in USB 3, it might be. And, um, and we're showing here it's 48 megabits per second. And we're showing two things here. On the left, it's the function. I'm sorry. On the left, it's the host side where you're putting out power. And um, if you can see my mouse moving there, I'm showing the poly switch device putting out power. And then the function could be your, your mouse, your keyboard, your, your web camera, or whatever, receiving power. Um, overcurrent protection is required on the host device and it's optional on the function device receiving power and we're showing here our poly zen device it's a combination poly switch and zener diode which we'll talk about in just a minute but it can be used as one option of protecting the function and then static discharge protection on both sides and uh, these are shown we're showing the individual uh, uh, single channel devices now in, um, in, in, uh, as you move to USB 3, you get higher data rates. And this slide is just showing you some typical download times. So you can see 
Um, back in the old days of USB 1, if you were trying to download a high-def movie, nine hours is the download time. And I guess not many people were watching high-def movies 10 years ago, but, but now we are. And USB 2, well, you can do it in almost 14 minutes, but you can see in USB 3, it drops to 70 seconds. So, so it's much better um, when, you're, when you're downloading uh, movies and things between one device or another, or when you're backing up your hard drive. You may have a lot of gigabits of data on an external hard drive or something you want to back up, so um, there's definitely a need to move a lot of data fast, and that's what people are demanding. So on the next slide here, we, s we can see the uh, schematic for USB 3. So there's, there's two, two major things happening with USB 3 that are different from USB 2. The main thing, of course, is you can see there's more wires here uh, for data. You got D plus, D minus, and you got these four extra wires. So we're operating at a higher speed and um, with more, more data lines that need protection. But the uh, really nice thing is that these, these connectors can accommodate both USB 2 and USB 3. So um, you can plug a USB 2 device into a USB 3 port, and you just won't be utilizing these extra wires. <clears throat> and um, there's still power going out. In USB 3, we, we uh, go to 0.9 amps. In USB 2, it was 0 .5, 0 0.5 amps, so, so more power. Still at 5 volts. The voltage did not change. Um, and then the basic idea still here is the same, where we have the host device putting out power, the function device receiving it, where you could use a poly's end device if you want, but certainly you need to use over current protection, which can be a poly switch device. It's the most common thing and most cost-effective way. And to, in order to, um, to uh, put the USB logo on your device and meet the USB spec, you do have to have some sort of over current protection. And then the static discharge protection optional, but, but it's, it's a good idea on both, both the host side and the function side. And because we have <clears throat> six devices, or six, six, um, six uh, wires here, six uh, conductors with data at a high speed, we need six protection devices. Now you can also use an array. That we, have, we have six channel arrays, we have four channel arrays, two channel arrays, so, so it's just up to the customer's choice whether they want to use a bunch of little devices or one, one multi-channel device. Okay, and then there's this other thing called USB power delivery, and I'm not seeing it much with our customers yet, but it's coming, and so I'll just talk about it a little bit. This is a new thing that was approved. I think they, they um, um, released the spec in July of 2012, and we're showing here just different devices that can be interconnected where you want more power. You know, everybody wants more data and more power. Um, the idea is uh, you can use USB ports to, to not just provide the 0.9 amps at 5 volts, but, but higher voltages and currents, like up to 100 watts for things like monitors or um, other gadgets, and do it all through the USB ports, and maybe reduce the number of wall, of wall wart power supplies uh, that you have you know, for all your, all your devices in your office. Um, empower them through a USB port instead of plugging 50 different things into the wall. Um, so this is but this is a different area, you know. This is this is USB power delivery. So this is a separate spec from uh, from the USB three we just spoke, spoke about. Um, but 100 watts is a lot of power to go through a little USB connector. So so this slide is showing how one scenario might be. Um, you only have one one power supply plugged into the wall on the left side here, and that's powering your monitor. And then that monitor has a bunch of USB ports that can you can charge your phone. You can you can uh, power and, and connect to your hard drive for backup, and even power your laptop computer. So normally the laptop computer would be powered off its internal battery or plugged into the wall with a you know, little power supply. But you're not using that here, you're just powering through the USB port. So it's a little bit more convenient, but 5 volts at 0.9 amps, 5 volts at 0.5 amps is, is, is uh, not enough for a computer. So that's why they came up with this power delivery spec. So, so maybe 20 watts, maybe 100 watts. Um, maybe 20 volts, so, so a lot more power, which means new protection issues or higher capacity protection devices you have to uh, use to accommodate this power. So um, when they came up with this USB power delivery spec, they came up with these different profiles, the highest being profile 5, where it's 100 watts, at, which could be at 20 volts and 5 amps. So um, uh, 
uh, you may not need that power. You could be a lower pro, a lower current voltage profile, which is like, for example, five volts and two amps, just a little bit more than uh, uh, what USB uh, three would be. Um, so, you know, again, I have not seen this with a lot of our customers yet, but it's coming. And, and if if anybody watching this is designing to these specs, um, well, we do have circuit protection devices, poly switch devices that can work at 20 volts and five amps or or lower currents and voltages. You know, whatever you need. Uh, there are devices available for this. Um, so for us, it's it's not an issue. Um, we just need to be ready and to help our customers when they start um, designing with this. So that's it for the spec overview. Now I'll go into the products. Um, there's no uh, questions or anything. I'm, I don't know if any... Uh, I think I can see the chat questions. I don't see any yet, so I'll uh, keep going. Very Yes. Barry, um, in terms, you know, I know you talked about USB uh, the 3.0 and the additional conductors coming out there, and um, you touched on, um, you know, that uh, T connectivity has some uh, array devices that could be used. Is there any, um, is there a particular instance in which a single device would be preferred or over an array, or vice versa, where you know a design engineer might want to go with an array versus the single device? Um, it seems to be personal preference. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to customers, I, I'm, I think, well, they're probably going to want an array if they're protecting four lines. But some people, just for their own lay board layout preferences, like to use four single-channel devices. Um, uh, you know, certainly if you're protecting just one channel, you'll you use a one-channel device. Um, and and generally, your 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 costs and board lay your board layout costs, your component costs, your labor goes down. If you use a multi-channel device, so so generally, you know, people have four channels to protect, or say six channels to protect in a USB 3 port. They'll use a um, a, a six-channel part, but so I'd say okay. that's the rule of thumb. But it's personal preference for a lot of people. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so we'll go to the product overview. So in our in our world of protection devices, um, uh, we we classify our products into three categories, uh, overcurrent protection, over voltage protection, and then hybrid and thermal protection, which is kind of a catch-all phrase for everything else. Uh, overcurrent protection refers to any device whose resistance goes up uh, when there's a fault condition. Now, in the case of fuses, well, fuses go to a complete open circuit, and um, everybody, I think, is familiar with fuses, and they're everywhere, and, and they work well. But of course, when they open, they have to be replaced. It's a permanent open. Um, and uh, uh, we have plenty of choices in little surface mount fuses that are soldered on your board. Um, but um, a lot of people prefer a resettable device, so our, so our poly switch resettable devices are an alternative, which we'll talk about, because they reset themselves and, and, and you don't have to, uh, no action is required by the end user to be back in business uh, after a fault condition. And over voltage devices refer to any device whose resistance increases, I'm sorry, who is normally a high resistance in parallel with the load, and then the resistance decreases or maybe goes to a short circuit when there's a fault condition so that that um, fault current is shunted to ground or away from whatever you're protecting. And so we have, uh, we'll talk about our, our uh, TVS diodes, which we call SESD or silicon ESD protection. We also have a polymer version, which is not used in the USB very often, so we won't talk about it here. And we also have these gas tubes, which are great, great for lightning protection but usually in telecom and you know, not in USB, sometimes in RF applications. And then these combination devices, uh, some of these are specific to telecom, AC power, battery packs, uh, automotive or, or MOSFET protection. But we'll talk about this PolyZen device, which is the combination poly switch and Zener diode. And we call that a hybrid device because it's two devices in one. So poly switch devices, um, we're showing here different shapes and sizes they come in. These disc parts go into battery cells. Uh, strap parts go external to cells, between the cells in a battery pack. But um, in USB, usually people use these surface mount parts. They might use a radial-leaded part, but, but these are you know, designed to be mounted on the circuit board. And um, as I mentioned before, they're resettable, so you get uh, reduced warranty rec costs and, and service calls and things like that because you don't have to service the customer to replace the blown fuse. And they're in a whole lot of applications, a lot of industrial and telecom and stuff. Consumer devices is probably our biggest area. 
USB is the probably the biggest subset of consumer devices. But USB ports are finding their ways into a lot of industrial and other stuff, uh, diagnostic equipment. Um, um, uh, USB is just a great way of connecting stuff together and transmitting power and data. So we're seeing a lot of our customers use USB ports in a lot of non-consumer applications also. So this slide shows how a polyswitch or PTC device works. The generic term is PTC, meaning positive temperature coefficient. And that's a generic term that refers to any device whose resistance goes up uh, when the uh, 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 temperature increases. And um, on this, on this uh, chart on the left here, you see a logarithmic scale of resistance versus temperature. For most of our devices, there are a fairly constant resistance. It uh, goes up a little bit, but at 120, 125 degrees Celsius, it goes up a lot by several decades because it's a logarithmic scale. And, um, and, and the schematic on the right just shows how a poly switch device would be in series. And then if there's a short circuit across your load, imagine a keyboard or mouse and you accidentally pinch or cut the wire going to it and cause a short circuit in that cable. Um, that's, that would be represented here. Uh, poly switch device has shown this RS uh, variable resistance symbol here. So when there's a high current, that high current causes I squared R heating inside the device, which causes it to get hot, which causes the resistance to go up. And when power is removed and it's allowed to cool back down for maybe 30 seconds or so, you go back down here to the low resistance condition and you're back in business. So you can imagine if you're in your office with a bad keyboard or mouse you plug into your computer, it would be really frustrating if every time you do that you blew a fuse or damaged your power supply, but instead um, you just borrow or steal somebody else's mouse from their desk, plug it into your computer, and uh, you're back in business, and hopefully they won't notice. Uh, <laughs> um, Barry, I got a quick question here. Um, I want one that came in, um, and that is, can poly switch devices be used in parallel? And then, uh, how quickly do poly switch uh, devices reset? Okay, and yes, they can be used in parallel. That that's a good question. Um, so, for example, if um, you're looking at a certain series of poly switch devices where the maximum operating current or maximum whole current is five amps, and you want to run at two amps, well, if you take two five amp rated poly switch devices and put them in parallel and uh, they're thermally isolated from each other then yes you will have a 10 amp hold current or be able, be able to carry 10 amps. If they're close to each other you might share some heating so maybe you only get 8 amps or something like that. So the you may may not double but, but certainly yeah you can do it. And how quickly do they reset? Um, about 30 seconds. You have to remove the power so they cool down completely because as long as they're powered up even when they're when they're tripped in the high resistance condition, they're still conducting a little bit of current, dissipating a little bit of power. Um, so they'll be generating heat and stay in the tripped condition. But when you remove power, it's about 30 seconds. Okay. And, and then Max, there, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there's a, there's a tail end uh, uh, question on uh, on that as well. Um, and then that, that's what uh, what is the maximum ambient temperature uh, where poly switches devices can be used? And for for most of our devices, it's 85 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, for the uh, subset of high temperature devices, mainly for automotive, it's a, um, and, uh, and some non-automotive applications, it's 125 degrees Celsius. Okay. Because they actually trip at like 150, 160. Very good. Okay, thank you. So I guess I'll go to the next slide. Oh, one thing I'll point out, um, yeah, PTC is our generic term. We, we say PPTC, meaning polymer positive temperature coefficient device. There are also ceramic devices, but they're, they're different. They're a little bit higher resistance usually. So this slide shows how they work. Um, inside the device, it's uh, polyethylene or some other plastic, um, which is non-conductive. And then these carbon particles are conductive, and current flows through very easily with the low resistance. But when you have high current that causes the I squared R, R, I squared R heating, which causes the device to get hot, well, this polymer will expand um, because it's actually at its melting point, but it doesn't melt because of the radiation cross-linking process we do in our manufacturing. That enables it to hold its shape but expand. And now you have fewer conductive paths for the current to flow, so this resistance goes up. And not just a gradual increase, it's a very sudden increase. So these are, these are different from your thermistors that might have a linear resistance increase. This is a very sudden increase that happens at 120 or 160 degrees Celsius for those higher temperature parts we mentioned. 
And so it's great for, for interrupting current, for limiting current in a fault condition. So that's how they work. Uh, and they come in all those different shapes and sizes and stuff. Uh, but uh, I'll move into overvoltage now. There's no questions. Uh, so in overvoltage, um, so I mentioned we have three types of devices. Uh, our SESD, or silicon electrostatic discharge, is the uh, main thing that's used in USB ports. Also in other things like HDMI and, and when you have high-speed video and stuff like that. And then the polymer devices, they're nice low capacitance devices, but they're, they're, they trigger at a higher voltage. And um, they're an older technology, but they work well. And then the gas tubes I mentioned for lightning protection, really high currents, but we won't go into that. So the silicon electrostatic discharge, SESD devices. Um, what we have are um, uh, several different single channel devices in 0402 and 0201 packages. And um, uh, you know these are really small, but uh, some of our customers who are designing handheld equipment tend to like these. And then we have an 0402 two-channel device here with three pads on it. And then the four-channel, a bigger one that's kind of an industry standard package, and then a smaller one um, if you want to save space, and then a six-channel device. And then uh, on, the, on the SESD topic, uh, Barry, another question. Uh, how does SESD help drop uh, insertion loss? OK. The main thing is, is by uh, low capacitance. Now, I guess you will always have the lowest insertion loss with without any protection in there, you know, with no SESD device. So, so adding an SESD device where there was not one before does not help with insertion loss. Um, but what it does is, is compared to an older device with high capacitance, then yeah, it has a lot less insertion loss than that. And, and the goal is, uh, or our hope is that the uh, capacitance is low enough that the, you know, the capacitance you're adding is insignificant. But an older technology that's like 5, 10 picofarads, if you add that, then sure. uh, you'll attenuate your signal. You might, depending on the frequency. OK. Uh, yeah, so, and we're showing here on the bottom line the, the, the picofarads of capacitance. And some of our devices are 0.1. The bidirectional devices are 0.1 because it's two diodes back to back. The unidirectional devices are 0.2 picofarads. And, um, um, and, and we do have some old other devices that are uh, several picofarads, you know. So this is like the latest and greatest we're showing here. And at USB 2, you probably don't care so much. At USB 3, yeah, you got to start worrying about how much capacitance you're putting in parallel. And then they can tolerate 20 kV. Um, there's an IEC spec, uh, IEC 61000-4-2, I think it is, um, where when you when you rub your feet on the carpet and then go and touch something and make that spark. Um, this specification tries to simulate what that might be in a typical or worst case scenario in your home or office. And they came up with a, a wave shape that's about 30 nanoseconds long. And um, the peak voltage is uh, 8 kV for a contact, in the case of contact, and 16 kV in an air discharge where it's arcing across the air. And so our parts can easily pass that. And in fact, they can take 20 kV for one hit um, of that same wave shape. Um, and uh, let's see. And then, then this, yeah, this chart is just showing the part numbers and sizes. And again, the, the, the key advantages are low capacitance and a high voltage withstand. And we're working on improving this coming out. But uh, we're working on a, a new product line that will have even higher uh, uh, voltage withstand capability. And then this chart is just showing some attenuation versus frequency and examples for different types of uh, communications, like HDMI, you know, for our DVD players and high def TVs and stuff. Um, they're showing up in a lot of applications, and uh, the high high data rates are at a high frequency. And then we're showing here the insertion loss is fractions of a decibel. Um, and then uh, USB three is in here, um, eSATA for hard drives. Um, Thunderbolt, which is a new thing that um, uh, very high data rates, um, it's starting to be used. And then the, the the charts in the background here show the signal attenuation or insertion loss up to six gigahertz. So that's what we've tested to. 
And this slide is just showing um, how these devices are flow-through arrays. Um, and uh, this is a nice, a nice way um, of laying out your board because you minimize the bends um, in your board traces. Um, the board traces go straight through underneath without having to bend to connect. Now, with the, on the upper left here, this two-channel device is, um, yeah, you do have to have um, a bend or a 90-degree turn in your board trace here, but in these others you don't. And then you have this common ground in the middle. So, so it's kind of nice to have the connector and then your uh, HDMI or U USB controller right in line with each other with a board trace going straight through underneath and this thing just uh, sitting on top and that simplifies your layout and minimizes uh, signal problems and stuff like that and uh, it's a good idea to put this protection device as close to the connector as possible there to keep the um, static discharge fault currents and voltages away from whatever you're protecting. You short it, you want to short it to ground um, as soon as possible when it enters the equipment. So that's what we mean by flow through arrays and um, and there are other people out there doing this. We have parts that are pin compatible with the other guys in case you want a second source and then parts that are unique to us as, as well when you're trying to minimize uh, uh, board space used up. So that's it for, for uh, silicon or for TVS diodes. Now we'll talk about if there's no questions, uh, we'll talk about the PolyZen device which is our uh, combination device so this device came about because we saw a lot of customers on a, on a DC input using a Zener diode in parallel and then maybe a fuse or a poly switch device in series. And the idea is um, uh, the Zener um, uh, the diode protects you in case um, somebody plugs in the wrong voltage. Now, um, in a USB port, it's not as likely, but it can happen. But in, in, in um, power supplies that are powered off of these wall warts where you have this very common barrel jack connector it's very easy to get mixed up between a you got a 12 volt power supply on your desk and a 6 volt power supply that use the same connector so you plug it into your equipment and then boom you've uh, just damaged something because you plug 12 volts into a 6 volt device. Um, so people use Zener diodes to protect against that. Now Zener diodes um, if they're sitting there clamping and limiting voltage they're dissipating a lot of power and getting hot. And um, you might need to then design your circuit with a high power Zener diode. Now, these people, these same customers often use a poly switch or fuse in series, um, but we always we realize, well, the poly switch device, yeah, it can help protect the Zener diode because it reacts to current. But if that diode is getting hot and it's sitting over here on the circuit board a few millimeters away from the poly switch device, well, um, it might not, the poly switch device might not sense the heat fast enough. Now, they do react to current, but they also react, react to temperature. If you can combine both of those parameters um, to make the poly switch device trip faster, that would be a much better device. So by putting the two devices right on top of each other, when the Zener diode gets hot, it causes the poly switch device to get hot and then it trips. So even if the current flow isn't that much, it'll still trip and protect the diode. Now you can downsize the diode and, and not use as big of a high power Zener diode as what you would normally use. So it turns out this is a very nice combination device that can save you um, board space because you're laying out only one component. It can save you um, uh, space because you're using a smaller component and it can save you cost. And um, one other thing it, it does is reverse polarity protection. If you plug in backwards, you'll around this current loop, if you can see my mouse here, you'll have a the Zener diode becomes almost a short circuit because it's forward biased. Now you have a very high current flowing in this loop. The poly switch device will then trip very quickly and save the diode, save your connector, board traces, and all that stuff. So um, it's a nice thing to have in generic power inputs and uh, USB ports also. Now, you wouldn't put it on the on the data lines. This is a very high capacitance, like 4,000 picofarad Zener diode. But on DC power, you don't care, so it works great there. And this chart in the lower right is just showing temperature versus uh, current for some tests we did in the lab um, w without the projection and with the projection, just showing how, how the Zener uh, is kept below its failure temperature. So I think we're near the end here, unless I go into any of the um, uh, uh, extra information slides or I pull up any data sheets. Or, uh, okay. or 
do get a quick question on uh, the PolyZen devices. Um, and yes. The question being, uh, how do PolyZen devices address USB suspend mode power consumption requirements? So are you, OK, uh, you said the uh, USB, I'm trying to read the question here. Suspend mode, OK. Yeah, so there, there are requirements on uh, the leakage current I, and, and the suspend mode. And I, th I think um, what they're referring to is, is maybe um, consuming uh, battery power during suspend mode. And, and yeah, we did come out with a special part for that um, uh, a few years ago. So um, our 5.6-volt um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, PolyZen device, you know, clamps at 5.6 volts plus or minus a little bit, um, allows a little bit too much leakage current for that particular application. So a few years ago, we came out with a 5.9 volt device, uh, which because the the voltage is a little bit higher, then it has less leakage current at 5 volts, and that met that requirement. And so we do have people using the 5.9 volt part. So, um, so that would be the answer to that. Uh, All right. And um, th these devices go from 5.6 up to 16.4 volts of clamping voltage and like 0.75 to 2.3 amps of operating current. So uh, they work great in that range. Um, we're working on, high, on on variations on smaller parts, and uh, um, but um, uh, sometimes we get asked for one that clamps at like 30 volts or so. And we don't have that yet. Uh, the the power dissipation is much higher at high volts, high voltage. So. Um, the, the combination doesn't work so well. But um, in the range of USB ports and 12 volts, 6 volts, that sort of thing, they work, they work great. Excellent. Um, any other questions or comments? I guess it went a little bit faster. We have a little bit of time left. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything up there right now. That was very informative, though. Thank you. Okay, and um, yeah, all these parts are available at DigiKey, and um, um, uh, and uh, uh, any uh, technical questions, you know, you can send to, send to us, and um, um, we get a lot of uh, uh, questions, you know, that I answer through email and stuff like that, and, um, and we have uh, reps around the country to, to help, so uh, we're here to help with any any uh, anything that might come up from our customers. Yep, and, and if there's uh, you know further questions or customers inquiring about um, you know what specific parts they may need or if they have a part number in mind, uh, they can always get a hold of us here at DigiKey and our technical support team and our product management team will be you know, more than willing to help them in that. Yeah, I, I answer a lot of questions, but I know you guys have some really good engineers there that, that answer a lot of questions before they ever get to me, so that's that's great. <laughs> Well, I don't. I think if there's uh, no other questions, I think we're uh, good for today. And I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us in this discussion. And if there's uh, you know any uh, follow-up questions that need to be asked, go ahead and uh, bring those into us, and we'll address them. So uh, thanks for your time, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm.